Right, so now let's continue our session on post heart reform methods. We have already shown almost everything we needed to have done during uh, the last time we met. Now, let's see where we are at post heart reform methods. Uh, we have covered configuration interaction. That's, let's see if we can find it. Oh, well, let's get into the full screen mode. Right, so we have covered configuration interaction where we expand, expressed the wave function in terms of an expansion of the Hartree fork reference state, all single excitations, double excitations, and higher excitations. Then we showed how configuration interaction is. If you include all kinds of excitations, you get what's called full configuration interaction or FCI. Uh, it's in principle exact within a certain basis, but you can't solve the equations except for very small systems. Unless you use stochastic methods, which go beyond the scope of this course. Then we went on to, oh yes, configuration interaction can be truncated, but those theories are not size extensive. We then went on to couple cluster methods, and couple cluster methods use this exponential ansatz, where this you have an exponential of the excitation operator T, which could then include as many levels of excitation as you want, from singles, doubles, triples. And uh, this leads to a size uh, consistent theory. So couple cluster, in fact, is one of the best theories we've got. Uh, the proof for size, ex size extensivity is, is quite simple. We have gone through it. But couple cluster, while it's brilliant, it's accurate, it's not as uh, computational cost of couple clusters not as high as full configuration interaction but it is quite bad because the theory we like to use CSD with brackets T the brackets T means um, the triple excitations are not put in exactly but they are put in through perturbation theory well this theory scales as the seventh power of the system size which means if you double the system size the calculation costs 128 times more that means if you could solve the water, one water molecule in a given basis, let's say in a minute, if you wanted to have two water molecules, well, it's going to cost substantially more. Now, there are ways you can bring this down, but you can't really change the scaling in the end. In the end, it will kill you. So you can use couple cluster on reasonably sized systems like, let's say, the benzene dimer, or if you had a very good computer, uh, something even larger, naphthalene, but eventually you will run out of computing power and memory. We then went on to perturbation theory and we looked uh, at what's called second order perturbation theory. We, in fact, we showed that the second order perturbation theory exp expression MP2 or MBPT2, MBPT just stands for many body perturbation theory and MP stands for molar placet, two of the authors. Uh, this has a very simple expression, so the second order perturbation theory uh, mp2 energy is given as a sum over states where we have energy differences in the denominator the a's and b's refer to virtual state energy levels and the i's and j's to occupied and in the numerator we've got a matrix element the coulomb integral ij not the, sorry not the coulomb integral the double bar means that this matrix element here this integral here is the coulomb integral ij ab minus the exchange integral I J B A, and if you've forgotten that, please go back a few lecture notes to the Hartree Fock lecture notes, where you will see how these terms have been defined. M P two is quite a nice theory. It's um, size extensive. We haven't shown this, but it can be shown. And if you want to see how it's size it's size extensive, look at the the book by um, one of our reference books by Bartlett and Shavit. It's quite an advanced reference book, but before it goes into details for each of these theories, it has quite a nice simple explanation as to what these theories are all about. And one of these explanations shows how MP2 is size extensive. I think Zabo and Austin might also do it, but I can't remember where or if it indeed is there. Okay, MP2 contains correlation. It's the first term in perturbation theory that goes beyond the Hartree fork. I have to remind you, uh, when we added up the zeroth order energy and the first order energy correction we got the hard fork energy 
So MP2 is the first term which goes beyond Hartree-Fock. Of course, you can continue this perturbation theory, but we've already seen it does not converge. In fact, this was shown, it was quite a surprising result, shown by Olsen, Jorgensen, and other authors, I've forgotten the entire list, in 2000. And I encourage you to look at that paper. I think this paper might also be discussed by Piella. So, as usual, please read Piella, the chapter on perturbation theory, which is quite illuminating. Now, MP2 has a computational cost of uh, n to the 5, which is not so bad, which means you double the system size and it will cost 32 times more. Uh, it sounds bad, but it's not as bad as couple cluster. It is size consistent or size extensive. And it's a useful theory. But it has systema systematic problems, but uh, this is kind of, again, beyond what we are going to see in this course. Okay, so... I have a question here, and uh, using the system of n non-interacting helium atoms, show that MP2 is size consistent. You will need the help of Bartlett's book to show this, so please look into Bartlett's book and find out where the size extensivity of MP2 has been discussed. Now let's look at, so those are, that's the kind of summary of the theory. Let's just look at where we are. Uh, this is a, a figure borrowed from the book by Helgaker, Jorgensen and Olsen in chapter 15. And once again, please go ahead and read these sort of relevant sections in these chapters because they are very, very uh, useful. So we want to reach an exact solution, which is on this top right corner. Uh, we start from the bottom left corner, which is where we kind of start with the heart. Actually, this dot should be even further down. We start with um, the Hartree-Fock solution, and then we go on including n-electron correlation. So as you move along the x-axis, we improve the n-electron wave function, and as you go up the y-axis, you improve the one-electron basis. Now, just to remind ourselves, the one-electron the one electron basis is the basis which is used to express the the Fock orbitals and in the linear combination of these basis sets. So if you stay with Hartree-Fock theory and you keep improving the basis set, you will improve the convergence. You will converge to a better and better Hartree-Fock result, but you will not gain any correlation. To gain correlation, you have to go along the x-axis. For example, you could go to MP2 or MP3. Three is not MP3 is not so good a theory. MP4 is not bad. Um, or you could go to couple cluster methods and include singles, doubles, triples, and this would move you along the x-axis. But moving along one axis alone is not good enough. What you need to do is to move along both. And uh, to approach this exact solution, you need to improve the one electron basis and reduce the n electron error by including more and more correlation. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, for a given method, so we have here, this is, am I in the race? Uh, if you're after a certain property, it could be an energy or a dipole moment or a polarizability. You have an experimental result, that's this black line on top. You choose a particular method and you improve the basis. This is what's shown on the x-axis. So on a small basis, you're down here. And as you improve your basis, you expect to get better and better closer to experiment. But you will never hit experiment because you will always have uh, an intrinsic error. That's the error of the method even in the infinite basis set limit. But what you can do is approach this dashed line, which is called the basis, the complete basis set limit for the method. All right, so now we can have a look, and this is the figure borrowed from Helgakar. You could have a look at Helgakar to see this more clearly. But uh, um, we've got Hartree-Fock on the top, then MP2, MP3, MP4, couple cluster SCCSD, CCSD with triples included and the truncated CI method, which you have all used in the labs, CISD, so sing configuration interaction with singles and doubles. What's plotted here is the error made by these methods, and the exact result is given by this straight line. And you have three different basis sets, the CCPVDZ, double zeta, triple zeta, and quadruple zeta. So the basis set in improves as we go to the from left to right. All right, and with the exception of CISD, the methods are improving as we go from top to bottom. Now let's look, have a look at Hartree-Fock. 
uh, we see a distribution, a wide distribution of errors with Hartree Fock. And the quantities here, by the way, are bond distances in parts per million. So it doesn't really matter what it is, but uh, Hartree Fock has a wide distribution of errors. As you improve the basis set, you do not change the distribution. The errors stay widely scattered, and basically, it's not a very predictive theory. If you include correlation, that's going to MP2. We now see, even at uh, in the smaller basis, the results are more peaked, and it's a narrower distribution. That's good. You improve your basis from a double zeta to a triple zeta, and now that peak moves. It's centered about the exact uh, result, which is good. Going to a quadruple zeta doesn't change matters. It still has the same distribution of errors, which means MP2, it's probably better to use an augmented triple zeta basis, but there's no point in going to an augmented quadruple zeta. MP3, well, you can see it's worse than MP2, which is something which we have all known for a while, but we don't know exactly why. MP4 is a better theory than MP2. It's much more costly. MP4 costs uh, scales as a seventh power of the system size, like couple cluster with singles, doubles, and uh, triples in these brackets in this perturbative way. Uh, MP4 can be improved as you go to larger basis sets. So with a double zeta basis, we have it's kind of like MP2. You go to a triple zeta basis, it's also like MP2, but with a quadruple zeta basis, the distribution becomes narrower, which MP2 does not. So MP2, MP4 in a quadruple zeta basis is on the average better than MP2. Now let's go to CCSD. CCSD is a theory we don't use again, and you'll see why from these data. Uh, the errors made by CCSD are worse than those made by MP2, and CCSD costs more than MP2. If I recall correctly, it scales as a sixth power of the system size, but please have a look at Helgaker's book uh, to confirm that. Now the jackpot, the sort of the gold theory, the gold standard, is CCSD brackets T, which is the second last data set here. Uh, CCSD brackets T in a small augmented double zeta basis is almost the same as MP2. So there's no point going, if you're going to use an augmented double zeta basis, there's almost no point using um, CCSD brackets T. You might as well use MP2. However, if you improve the basis size to the augmented triple zeta, the distribution of errors is now quite narrow and is strongly centered at the experimental result. And if you go into a quadruple zeta, this becomes even better. This is the theory we should be using if we could afford it. And it's pretty clear from this very narrow distribution of errors that, you know, it works. CISD, our truncated CI method by contrast, is really just better than Hartree Fock, but it's nowhere as good as any of the other theories here. Okay, so once again, this is another graph you have seen before. Uh, we have, you know, if you come, in this case, we are looking at uh, equilibrium bond distances in parts per million and you can see that uh, the solid bar here is the experimental result. If you start off with Hartree Fock, you make a large error, you use MP2, you go up and you're pretty close to experiment now. You use CISD thinking you could do better but it doesn't, it's worse. You use MP3, surely that's better than MP2 but it isn't. On the average MP MP3 is worse than MP2. MP4 will take you closer to experiment again. And uh, for the couple cluster method, here you are, it's really very close to exper experiment, and it's generally consistently so, as long as you use a big enough basis. Okay, uh, this is the same kind of data set as I've shown you earlier, but this time it's for bond angles, and the bottom line is the same. Couple cluster in a large basis is pretty good, but so is MP2. All right, so this is our gold standard, CCSD brackets T in an augmented triple zeta basis. Now, I have used this augmented basis here. Uh, why? Because the augmentation adds diffuse functions, and we have discussed this before. And diffuse functions are, are really important when you're trying to describe something dealing with the density tails, which are the outer part of the density, or excitations. And we will see that, you know, using 
diffuse functions can dramatically improve the van der Waals interactions, polarizabilities, dispersion coefficients, and even uh, electrostatic moments if you're looking at the higher order moments, higher ranking moments. We can also use MP2, but if you do, use it with caution. You have to know when MP2 works and when it fails. Now, we haven't discussed this, but in general, MP2 tends to fail when you have pi delocalizations, as in benzene or naphthalene. This is where MP2 becomes a little dodgy. Of course, you could use density functional theory, which is the topic we are getting to. But before we get to density functional theory, I want to comment on the actual cost of these correlated methods. Now you've seen, we've already discussed computational scaling. Hartree-Fock is n to the 4, MP2 is n to the 5, CIST is n to the 6, but we don't care about it. Couple cluster with singles, doubles, and triples, non-iterated, is n to the 7. Okay, this already looks bad for the correlated methods, but there's one more reason why they are expensive, and we have seen this from those distributions of errors. When you get to correlated methods, you need to use larger basis sets. Couple cluster in a small basis set is not better than MP2. You have to use a larger basis set. Question now is why do we need this larger basis set? And for that, we need to talk about cusps. Now, we haven't really covered cusps properly in class, so I've mentioned it very often, but we haven't seen the proof. So I need to go back to some of the other lecture notes for this. And uh, let's pause this part of the presentation here. Right. So we are back online, and I believe it is recording. Uh, I'm now going to take you through some results which we have used but never proved, or proved only parts of it. And uh, we're going to use these results. So this, this is now part of the exact results uh, set of lecture notes. We're going to use these results um, to not only understand why correlated methods are so expensive, but also to better understand how density functional theory is going to help, and it's going to help enormously. The date on these lecture notes is from last year. Well, the theory hasn't changed since last year, so we were going to use this. So let's start this presentation. Uh, we're going to begin with the asymptotic form of the wave function. Now, basically, what we're going to show is that the n electron wave function psi, when you pull one electron away from it, it will collapse into an n minus 1 electron part and an exponential part for that one electron. Correspondingly, the density for the n electron uh, system will decay as an exponential. Now, let's have a look at what's in this exponential before we actually prove anything. It's just the ionization energy which determines what the exponent is. By the way, the little r here is not under the square root. Keep that in mind. So the density goes as the exponential of minus twice the square root of twice the ionization energy multiplied by r. As soon as you know the ionization energy, the vertical ionization energy, then you will know how the density of the system will decay, which means that if you have a system that's easily ionized, so the EI is small, then this exponent will be small, and that means you will have a very slowly decaying density. On the other hand, if you have something that takes a lot of energy to be ionized, then this exponent will be large, and you will have a pretty tightly confined density. Now, this, make, this should be intuitively perfectly agreeable. If an outer electron is only weakly bound to, this, to, a, to the uh, system, then it can be pulled out to infinity, that is ionized, easily. And a weakly bound electron will have a large orbit in the classical sense, so you, will you should expect a diffuse density. On the other hand, if the outer electron is very strongly bound, uh, then you should have a very compact density. All right? So the ionization energy determines the shape of this density density. Now how do you prove it? Well, I have a few lecture notes I have written up, but before going to the proofs, let's have a look at the other result which we're going to need. It's called the electron nuclear cusp condition, and this states that um, as you approach, so what we're trying to state is that as 
if you look at the, the behavior of a wave function near a nucleus, now remember in the bottom Oppenheimer approximation these nuclei are fixed, but this doesn't really is not really needed for the proof. But if you look at the uh, behavior of the wave function near the nucleus and you differentiate the wave function at the nucleus, so this is the d psi by d r i alpha. R i alpha is simply the position of electron i from nucleus alpha, and you set that distance to be zero then you will get a non-zero quantity which is proportional to the nuclear charge so minus z alpha and the wave function at that point so the wave function where r i alpha is set to zero okay we need to understand what this means graphically but there's one more cusp condition we need before we move on and that's called the electron electron cusp condition and that's given here if you have if we now look at the electron separation between two electrons, i and j, so that's r, i, j, and we look at the wave function just as the function of these two electrons coordinates, so d psi by d r i j, look at this derivative as the distance between the two electrons goes to zero, then you find that it is plus one half times the wave function at r i j is equal to zero. Now this, uh, this, uh, this result strictly applies to a singlet state only. For a triplet state, we have a plus one quarter, but we want, I want to show you a proof here. Okay, so these cusp conditions are going to be quite important for what we are going to see next. So let's have a look at how these things are proved, and for that I've written a few handwritten lecture notes, which take the place of our blackboard. So let's have a look at those. I'm going to pause the presentation now while I find Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is the asymptotic form of the wave function and rho. Uh, now the proof of this is in the lecture notes on the exact results, but these extra notes give, fill in a bit some of the details which are missing there, which I would have put up on the whiteboard. Alright, so what we are interested in now is a finite system. Everything we're going to be dealing with here applies to a finite system. It does not apply to a crystal but it does apply to a crystal which has been cut so you have a finite you have a surface which defines a boundary okay so we've got a finite system in this case let's have a look at uh, a very simple finite system we have only one electron so n is equal to one and we might have a few nuclei I've labeled them by z1 z2 z3 the Hamiltonian for the system then is h is equal to minus a half the kinetic energy uh, the Laplacian uh, remember we are in atomic units, so there are no fundamental constants, so those have been set to be 1. So it's, it's a kinetic energy part, and then we have an attractive term uh, which collects all the electron nuclear interactions. Alright, now we can write down the, um, the Laplacian in spherical uh, polar coordinates as, so we get a minus a half, then we have a second derivative with respect to r, plus twice 2 over r d by dr and then I've collected all the uh, angular terms in theta and phi under this L squared operator divided by r squared. We'll see why in a minute and then we have the electron nuclear interactions as before. Now what we are interested in, we are interested in the behavior of the wave function and density as you pull this electron away from the system. Now that means you're pulling one electron away from all the other charges in the system. In this case, there is only one electron and the other charges are all nuclei. So we are pulling this one electron away from the nuclei and we are interested in the r tends to infinity limit. Okay, so if r tends to infinity, then let's have a look at this Hamiltonian. Uh, I want a leading order behavior. By leading order behavior, it means drop out any term that is of 1 over r or 1 over r squared, etc. So the electron nuclear interactions go as something over r, because if r is much greater than r alpha, then this term goes to zero. The uh, uh, angular momentum terms likewise are goes as one over r squared, so this goes to zero. Then we have the second term in the in the differential with respect to r. This has got a two over r that goes to zero, and we're left with just the first term. So the Hamiltonian then becomes just h in this r tends to infinity limit is minus a half d squared by dr squared. That's it. 
Therefore, the Schrodinger equation in this limit is h psi is equal to e psi. That becomes minus a half d squared psi by dr squared is equal to e psi. Now we know the solution to that. The solution is an exponential. Please check it. Don't take my word for it. And that, so the wave function must have the form some a, which will be a constant, but it's not really a constant. It actually contains uh, powers of r, which we have ignored because we have kept only the leading order term. So we have some a uh, times an exponential, and this is what we're after. And this exponential is e to the minus the square root of minus 2e n square root times r. Okay. Now e is a, an energy, it's a bound state, so e is negative, which means this uh, term under the square root is in fact positive. So there's nothing suspicious about this. If e was not a bound state, you would get uh, a complex exponential here but we're not interested in those. Let's have a check. For the hydrogen atom in its ground state, the energy is minus a half in heart rate, and which means our wave function should be some constant times e to the minus r, which is in fact exactly the correct wave function. What about the density? Well, if you know the wave function, the density for a one electron system is just rho is equal to mod psi squared, which means the density decays as e to the minus 2 square root of minus 2e n square root times r. Okay, that's easy. Now what about n, n electrons? Yeah. So now n is greater than 1. It's a many electron system. What are we going to do? Well, we have an n electron system. It's finite. And this system will be associated with a Hamiltonian hn, a wave function psi n, and the Schrodinger equation hn psi n is equal to en psi n. Now we pull one electron out of the system we end up with an n minus 1 electron system which will generally be much more compact than the n electron system. Why? Because you have few electrons compared to the nuclei. Uh, this one electron then is here, it's the e minus, and it's separated by distance r from this n minus 1 electron system. Um, What's the effective interaction between this electron and this n minus 1 electron system? Well, the n minus 1 electron system, if we started off with a neutral system and we pull one electron out, then we will have a charge of plus 1 here, which means the effective interaction is minus 1 over r. Now, if we did not start off with a neutral in system, then this effective interaction will not be minus 1 over r. For example, if we had an anion here with a single minus charge, I pull one electron out, it will see a neutral n minus one electron system. So just think about it when if you're faced with a case where you, you're not working with a neutral system. But here we have an effective interaction of minus one over r. Uh, what about the Hamiltonian? Well, the Hamiltonian for the n electron system was hn. When you pull this electron out, if the electron is sufficiently far away, we will have the, the Hamiltonian splitting into two parts. The Hamiltonian for the n minus 1 electron system, it's h n minus 1, plus the Hamiltonian for this one electron system, I'll call it h1. What about the wave function? Well, the wave function, wave function for the n electron system was psi n. This becomes psi n minus 1, that's the wave function for the n minus 1 electron system, multiplied by psi 1, which is the wave function for this one electron. Now just to remind you, Hamiltonians add, energies add, wave functions multiply. Right? Don't add a wave function to another wave function of a different number of electrons. You have to multiply them. And this goes back to vector spaces, if you think about it. All right, there's one more relation we need, we're going to need. Uh, Hn minus 1 operating on psi n minus 1 will be the energy of the n minus 1 electron system. That's E n minus 1 times psi n minus 1. I don't know what E n minus E n minus 1 is, I don't care. We'll find out how we get rid of it. Now what about anti-symmetry? Uh, for any finite separation we would have, we would need to anti-symmetrize this product, psi n minus, psi of n minus 1 times psi 1. It would need to be anti-symmetrized with respect to electron exchange between this one electron here and these n minus 1 electrons here. But we are in the R going to infinite limit we don't need the anti-symmetrization, so we're going to ignore it. All right, so now let's start. In this R tends to infinity limit, we start off with this uh, um, with the um, 
I should have an n over here, my mistake. It should be en psi n is equal to hn psi n. That's the just, just this um, Schrodinger equation. I've just put it down here and forgotten the n's by mistake. Uh, now let's put in our limiting cases for psi n. Well, psi n becomes psi n minus 1 times psi 1 and hn becomes hn minus 1 plus h1. Let's put that here. So we have en psi n minus 1 times psi 1 is equal to, in brackets, hn minus 1 plus h1, close brackets, psi n minus 1 times psi 1. Uh, what is h1? Well, h1 is the contains the kinetic energy for this electron, which has been pulled out, and this effective interaction of minus 1 over r. Remember, we have a minus 1 over r because this electron interacts with the hole left behind. But we don't need it right now. All right, so on the left-hand side, we still have en psi n minus 1 times psi 1. That's equal to, on the right-hand side, we're going to have hn minus 1 operating on psi n minus 1. Remember, hn minus 1 operates on the n minus 1 electrons. It can't operate on psi 1, which is the other electron. So we have hn n minus 1 operating on psi n minus 1 in brackets times psi 1 plus psi n minus 1 and then h1 operates only on psi 1. Well hn minus 1 operating on psi n minus 1 is e of n minus 1 times psi 1. We have seen that over here. And then we have, uh, well just bring the second term down onto the next line. Now let's reorganize this. Let's pull this term here to the left which is here and that's going to be uh, en minus en minus 1 in brackets times psi n minus 1 times psi 1. Well this is simply this term in the brackets this energy difference is simply the negative of the vertical ionization energy. So we've come down to a fairly simple equation which involves just the ionization energy and I don't need to know what these energies of this n and n minus 1 electron systems actually are. I just need to know their difference. All right, so now we are nearly at the end. So here's our equation. Psi n minus 1, h1 operating on psi 1, is equal to minus the ionization energy. Psi n minus 1, psi 1. Now we need to get rid of the psi n minus 1. The simplest way to get rid of it is to take the inner product with psi star n minus 1 and integrate over the n minus 1 electrons and if we're dealing with normalized wave functions, actually you don't even need to make them normalized, you just cancel off the two inner products from the left and right to get a beautifully simple equation, h1 psi1 is equal to minus the ionization energy times psi1. This is a one electron Hamiltonian Schrodinger equation where the energy eigenvalue is minus ei. And we know what the asymptotic form of psi1 is going to be from the first result we had proved psi1 must decay as an exponential and it's going to be minus the square root. Uh, we get a plus 2ei because we have a minus sign here, times r. And that means that the n electron wave function decays as psi of n minus 1 times this exponential over here. In other words, the n minus 1, the n electron system collapses into an n minus 1 electron system and an exponential one electron wave function. What about rho of r? Ah, think about it. Show that rho of r decays as the exponential of minus twice the square root of 2ei times r. So once you know the ionization energy, you will know how rho behaves at long range. That's the first of the important results, which we're going to use extensively in density functional theory. All right. Now, this once again, this also means that if you're dealing with a very diffuse system of electrons, then we are going to have, which means that your ionization energy was small, then we should expect to use, to, you know, rho to be nice and long-ranged. If you were dealing with a system which had a large ionization energy, for example, helium, then the density for helium is going to be pretty compact because this exponential will be a large number. Okay, so now let's move on to the next of the results we're going to need. I'm going to pause the video here while I find that. Okay, so the next result is, uh, the next two results are the cusp conditions. These are often called the Kato, K-A-T-O, 
cusp conditions of Toshio Kato, who was uh, one of the pioneers in deriving a number of these exact uh, relations for wave functions and densities. Essentially, what these cusp conditions tell us is how the wave function behaves at a nucleus. And what we're going to show is that the first derivative of psi with respect to R, where R is the separation from the nucleus, is minus Z, the nuclear charge, times psi at that nucleus. Okay, so basically, pictorially, if you've got a nucleus with a very large Z, then we expect a much more strongly peaked uh, uh, wave function there, and this derivative is going to be large. But if you've got a small Z, just a nuclear charge of plus one, for example, then you will have a smaller slope there. Uh, I've got these slopes wrong in case um, I, after drawing it I'd realized it. The slope is generally measured um, on this side, on the right side, so it's so uh, the slope of this cusp would be negative. Not the way I've shown it, but I have a positive slope. Okay, now the general result for the Cato cusp condition is that the spherical average of this derivative is equal to minus z times the spherical average of the wave function at that point, but I'm not going to worry about that, it's not so important. Because what we'll do is we'll simply deal with uh, spherically symmetric states and then just ignore the spherical average. But I thought you should know about it. So what does the proof look like? Well, we need to prove this result. Um, so we're going to assume a one electron system in an S state, that is the angular momentum is zero. And uh, let's start by just having a single nucleus at some point in that system and the nuclear charge is going to be z. Okay, so the Hamiltonian then looks like this. H is minus half uh, Laplacian plus the potential which is then given as we've seen before it's going to be minus a half and all these terms. This is your angular momentum term there minus z over r. Alright, so the Schrodinger equation is h psi is equal to e psi. Now e is finite. It's a bound state e is finite. Let's write it in this form. E psi is equal to H psi. Remember, the left-hand side is the finite quantity. Now, let's write down the Hamiltonian in a few steps. So, we have minus a half d squared psi by dr squared, and then we have the other terms on this next line here. Now, uh, this middle term, this L squared operating on psi is zero because we are in an S state, so L is zero. Okay. Now, if you look at this now, as r tends to zero as this electron approaches the nucleus uh, these terms on the second line diverge but the left hand side is a finite quantity so the only way that you could have a you know divergent terms on one side and a finite quantity on the other side is if these terms go off to zero so if we set the sum of these terms on the left hand side remember on the right hand side beg your pardon remember this middle term is zero itself, then we get the cusp condition. d psi by dr as r tends to zero is equal to minus z times psi naught. That's it. So what about the density? Well, the density also contains its cusp, so now d rho by dr will decay as minus two twice z uh, the density at uh, the point r is equal to zero. I'd like you to show it. You can show it quite simply by starting from rho is equal to mod psi squared for a one electron system and then see if you can show this result. There's another cusp condition we're going to need and that's the electron-electron cusp condition. For this I'm going to go back to those lecture notes on exact systems. So let's find it. Here we are. And make this into full screen mode. Alright, now what do you do with the electron-electron cusp condition? This can be a little tricky, but uh, if you pay attention, it's going to be quite simple. The key point here is to note that as two electrons approach each other, the only thing that matters is how these two electrons are interacting. All the other things going on in the Hamiltonian in the wave, in the wave function don't matter because as these electrons approach each other, their energies, their kinetic, kinetic energy, their repulsion energy, remember there's a repulsion here, are going to dominate everything else. So what we're going to do then is to make an effective two-particle Schrodinger equation for these two electrons only. And that is going to look like a hydrogenic system. So that's the uh, Schrodinger equation I've got here. 
E psi is equal to, we have a kinetic energy part and then this plus 1 over R interaction. Why is it plus? Because it's an electron-electron repulsion. So that's the plus 1 over R. And here, instead of having just minus a half Laplacian, we've got minus 1 over 2 mu. Because these two electrons have the same mass, so we have to go into a center of mass coordinate system. Remember, they are whizzing around each other, and we can't assume that one is at rest and the other the other is going around it. So we have a, a reduced mass in here, and, and mu is equal to one half. Now, if you've forgotten why the reduced mass is one half, please go back to your classical mechanics and figure it out. All right, so we do the same analysis which you have seen for the cathode cusp for the electron nuclear interactions. E psi is equal to eight psi is equal to uh, we don't have a half anymore because of the reduced mass, so minus d squared psi by dr squared, etc. Now, if we are interested in a singlet state, then once again, L squared operating on psi is going to give us zero. So we have, if we want the left-hand side, which is a finite quantity, to equal to the right-hand side, then we must have this term plus this term equals to zero, which is what I put down in the last statement here. And if we cancel off the r's before taking the limit r tends to zero. Uh, by the way, r here is a short form for rij. Then we end up with the electron elect electron cusp condition d psi by drij, where rij goes to zero, is equal to plus one half psi, with rij equals to zero. Okay, so. With these two cusp, cusp conditions under our belt, we are now in a position to understand why these uh, correlated methods cost as much as they do. Let's now move to those lecture notes back again. Here we are. So now we are back at the post hartree fock methods lecture notes. Let's say we were interested now in, in modeling helium in its 1s ground state. And we decided initially to use a wave function of the form psi is equal to 1s alpha, 1s beta. We're putting the alpha and beta electrons in the 1s orbital, which is perfectly fine. This is a, an anti-symmetric wave function. But if I wanted to satisfy the electron-electron cusp condition, if I wanted to make sure that uh, as these two electrons approach each other, the derivative of the wave function with respect to r12 would be plus one half psi the wave function at that point then i would need to have this extra term one plus one over one half r12 included in here why well if you differentiate psi with respect to r12 forget the determinant part for the time being then you will get a plus half which is exactly what we need for this electron electron cusp condition now, this is explained quite nicely in PLR's book, so please read PLR's discussion also. All right, so we need this. Now, we are using Gaussian basis sets, right? Everywhere we use Gaussian basis sets, and those basis sets don't have an R12 term. So is there some way you can use a Gaussian basis set without the R12 term? And there is, because you can always express this R12 mathematically in terms of an infinite sum of angular momenta, this is a Legendre polynomial here, at a different L, L is now my angular momentum, and then we have these polynomial terms multiplying it in R. Never mind exactly what it means, the point here is that we, have, we need an infinite sum of various angular momentum terms to represent R12. You truncate a sum at any point and you get an approximation to R12. Pictorially, and this is something we're going to see in Helgakar, from taking pictures some figures from Helgakar. This is what we are looking at. Now what I've done, what Helgakar, Helgakar has done here is to keep one electron fixed at a distance of one atomic unit from the nucleus, from where the basis functions actually are. Remember, so this is our nucleus. This is where we put our Gaussian basis sets. And we have one electron here at, at one. So the R12 function is this solid line, this fuzzy solid line. This is what R12 looks like if you plot it with one electron fixed at one. And this is what the R12 will look like for the other electron. Now, if you if you truncate this this 
expansion at different values of L, this is what you end up with. This is for L is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. As you go to higher L values, uh, you start to describe this electron-electron interaction, this R12 term, better and better. Uh, at L is equal to 50, which is a term you cannot see, there's a line going almost through the solid fuzzy line. But you need to go to pretty high um, expansion orders. Now these expansion orders correspond to the um, angular momenta in our basis functions. Now what correlation methods are trying to do is they're trying to describe this electron-electron interaction. Okay, now if you want to describe the electron-electron interaction, you have to describe these terms which are, behave like R12. Now the only way you can describe these terms which behave like R12 is to then have uh, basis functions which have pretty high angular momenta in them. When you have those high angular momenta, you start to describe these, uh, this R12 interactions better and better. Now what this means then is that if you wanted to use couple cluster correctly, you would need to include use a basis set which had sufficiently high angular momentum terms in it so that the couple cluster method could start to describe this electron-electron cusp correctly. So not only does couple cluster scale badly to begin with, it's n to the seven, but now you need to include a you need to use a larger basis set. Otherwise you can't describe this electron-electron interaction, so there's no point using couple cluster. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, what Helgakar has done here, this is figures from chapter 7 again, is they've taken the helium atom and they've fixed one electron at 0.5 from the nucleus. So I think you can see a little kink over here in this. Uh, the left hand side of the wave function is nice and smooth and the right hand side has a kink in it. And on the left over here, what they've done is gone uh, around the nucleus in a circle, so this is now an angular coordinate here, and uh, at the origin, so at the point where the angle is zero, you have this kink showing up. Alright, so, so the goal of your correlated method is to describe this kink in the wave function. Now why is there a kink in here? Because you have one electron fixed here, so there's a depletion of electrons around it, and that's what the kink represents. It says, I've got a Coulomb hole here, I'm repelling other electrons away from me, there's the depletion in electrons around it. All right, so let's skip that. Let's use um, Hartree-Fock. Hartree-Fock is a dashed line in this. And you can see that Hartree-Fock really doesn't care. I mean, there is no king in Hartree-Fock. Hartree-Fock, the electrons don't know where each other they are. So you may fix one electron at 0.5, but Hartree the Hartree-Fock wave function says, well, I don't know where you are. So there is no kink in Hartree-Fock. What then can you do? Well, you could start to include correlation. Now, what they've done by including correlation is through this Hiller-Ras wave function. It doesn't really matter uh, what it is at this point, but you can compute the Hiller-Ras wave function at different uh, angular momenta terms or different ranks. So the n is equal to two here means we are now including terms which go to rank two. Or, and you can see the Hiller-Ras wave function, the solid line, the thin solid line, is better than Hartree-Fock it's kind of at least got a depression where the kink should be and it's asymmetrical on the left and the right it's not symmetrical as you go to higher and higher ranks the Hiller-Ras wave function starts to approach that cusp and that's what makes it a good wave function so in summary then Hartree-Fock we can use a small basis because there are no electron-electron cusps in this and you don't need to include higher angular momentum terms up, you know, beyond a certain point. Now you still need to include higher angular momentum terms to describe bonding, but you don't need to include these terms to describe the electron-electron correlation effects. But as you go to these correlated methods, you start to need them, and the higher your correlation level is, the more angular momentum terms you need to describe the electron-electron correlation effects. So for a correlated method like CCST brackets T, you get killed computationally because of the n to the 7 scaling, and you get killed computationally because you need to use a larger basis.
to begin with. Now this looks like a disaster, so we need some way around it. And this way, the, the way we're going to see is to go to density functional theory, where we say we don't need the high angular momentum terms. We don't have an electron-electron cusp. We don't have a wave function. We just have the density. But that is the next story. So let's stop here.